So this lecture is part of an online course on commutative algebra and will be mainly about the following question, what is a syzygy? So this comes from a Greek word meaning a yoke, where you, if you have two oxen pulling a plow, you yoke them together. And we'll sort of see a little later why, why mathematical syzygies are called this. So the aim of the next few lectures is Hilbert's theorem on um, finite generation of rings or algebras of invariants. So um, I better start by explaining what an invariant ring actually is. So let's just look at example one. Let's look at rotations of R3, or we can allow rotations and reflections. So here we have a group denoted by the orthogonal group, or maybe the special orthogonal group if you're restricting to rotations. So it'd be O3 of R, it's just three by three orthogonal matrices. And rotations and reflections preserve length. So you can think of length as being an invariant of this group. It means if you act by any group on the um, any group element on two points of R3, the length, the distance between those two points will be preserved. Well, another way of saying that is it preserves the polynomial x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Um, so um, this just being the square of the length. Um, so we can think of x squared plus y squared plus z squared as being an invariant of O3 of R acting on the vector space R3. So X, Y, and Z are all linear functions on R3. So this is just a polynomial on R3. And we have a similar question where you can replace the orthogonal group by your favorite group and replace R3 by any vector space acted on by this group. Um, there's one actually slight tricky technical question, which is how does G act on polynomials? So if G is acting on a vector space V, what we really want is how does G act on a polynomial function from V to R or our field K or whatever? Um, so this is part of a general question. Suppose you've got a function from a space X to a space Y where X and Y are acted on by G. In, in our example, G acts trivially on K, but more generally, we can allow F, we can allow G to act non-trivially on Y. And so what is G of F? Well, in order to indicate the action of G of F, you need to say what it does to X. And this is usually defined as follows. If you apply G F to X, then this is equal to G of F of G to minus one X. And there's a bit of a puzzle here because you can look at this and well, the G is fairly natural, but what is this doing? Why do we put in a factor of minus one there? Um, well, I'll first explain why we put in a factor of minus one, and then I'll explain what goes wrong if you don't. Um, so what we the, the, the rule shouldn't really be written like this. It's better to write it like this. We write GF applied to G of X is equal to G of F of X. And this, if you think about it, is really just a, a sort of special case of what happens if a group acts on A times B, then you want G of A times B equals G of A times g of b. And here b might be x and a might be a space of functions from x to y and then this rule here turns out to be essentially this rule here. Now if you change x to g to the minus 1x you get this rule g f of x equals g f g to the minus 1x. So this rule looks a bit odd but this rule looks much more natural so maybe it's better to remember the action of G as looking like this. The other question is what happens if you miss this out? Um, and if you miss it out, you run into a nasty mess. So let's try putting GF of X 
equals f of g of x. Let's make the action of g on y trivial, just so it's one less thing to think about. So what happens if we define that? Well, then we run into this horrible problem. If you type g1, g2, f of x, well, on the one hand, this is equal to f of g1, g2 of x, because we can just move g1, g2 into the inside. On the other hand, it's equal to g2 of f acting on g1 of x, because we can move the g1 inside. And then it's equal to f of g2 of g1 of x. And if you look at this, you see we get a contradiction. These are actually different. So, so um, if you don't put in this minus one when you're defining actions of groups on functions, you really run into horrible contradictions. So we better don't ever do this. Um, another way is um, you can put the g on the right. If f acts on the right on x, then, then you can indeed put x times g there and get away with it. But So there's this, you have to remember there's this irritating and confusing slight complication when, when you want to define group actions on functions. You sometimes need to use the inverse of the group. Um, so next example of invariance is um, just determinants. So here's example two. Suppose we take the special linear group n over a field acting on k to the n. So I'm just going to take n equals two. So you might have a, b, c, d acting on vectors x1, x2 in the usual way, which I can't be bothered to write out. And there are no interesting invariants of this. In fact, SL2 of n acts transitively on all non-zero vectors of k, so you can't really have any non-constant functions that are invariant. On the other hand, we can make k to the n bigger. We can have SL2 of k acting on k to the n plus k to the n plus k to the n and so on. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take n copies. So we might have a, b, c, d acting on a space x1, x2. So that'd be one copy of k to the n. And it might act on y1, y2. Um, and now we can find an invariant. We can just take the determinant of this stuff here. So in this case, we can just take the determinant, which will be x1, y2 minus x2, y1. And in general, the determinant on k to the n plus plus k to the n is an invariant of SL2, sorry, SLn of k. And that's not terribly surprising because you basically define the special linear group to be the, to be the matrices that preserve the determinant when it's acting on n by n matrices. So the determinant is an example of an invariant. And um, by the way, if you look at the word determinant, it ends in the word ant. And pretty much anything that ends in the word ant tends to be an in invariant of something. Um, I guess it comes from the ant at the end of invariant. So you get things like determinant, resultant, discriminant, catalecticant, and all sorts of other weirder things. And that they all tend to be invariants of some group acting on something. Well, so far we've only had one invariant at a time. So let's look at a more complicated example where there are several invariants. So this time I'm going to take G to be the symmetric group of all permutations of N objects. And I'm going to let it act on um, uh, C to the N by permuting coordinates. So, um, polynomials, the polynomial functions on these are just going to be polynomials in x1 up to xn. And the symmetric group just acts on polynomials by permuting x1 up to xn. In, um, and the problem is, let's find invariant functions or invariant polynomials. So we want to find polynomials that stay the same if you renumber all the um, or, or, or all the variables. And that's an obvious one. Let's try E1, which is, you can just add them all up. 
and that's obviously stays the same if you permute them, or you can multiply them together. Um, or you can add up products of pairs of them. So we can take E2 equals X1, X2 plus X1, X3, and so on all the way up to Xn minus 1, Xn. And these are the, the, the famous elementary symmetric functions. Um, you can write them all down by thinking of the xi's being roots of a polynomial. So if we take y minus x1 times y minus x2 up to y minus xn, this is equal to y to the n minus e1 y to the n minus 1 plus e2 y to the n minus 2 plus or minus en. Um, so um, this gives some obvious invariance. And the, the question is, is every invariant a polynomial in E1 up to En. And this is the basic theorem of symmetric functions, which says, yes, it is. So every invariant polynomial in X1 up to Xn is a polynomial in E1 up to En. And the proof of this is quite easy. So I'll just give it in a couple of minutes. What we define is an order on the monomials. So we say x1 to the m1, x2 to the m2, and so on, is greater than x1 to the n1, x2 to the n2, if it's bigger in lexicographic order. So this means m1 is greater than m n1, or m1 equals n1 and m2 is greater than n2, or m1 equals n1, m2 equals n2, m3 is greater than n3, and so on. And now what we do is we suppose f is invariant. And what we do is we look at the biggest monomial in F. So suppose it's x1 to the n1, x2 to the n2, and so on, x3 to the n3, and so on. So, so suppose this is the biggest one we can find. And now all we do is we subtract x1 plus x2 and so on to the n1 minus n2 times x1, x2 plus and so on times n2 minus n3 um, times x1, x2, x3, and so on, plus times n3 minus n4, and so on. And this kills off the biggest monomial in F. And you just continue. So we can subtract a, a, a polynomial in these elementary symmetric functions and kill off the biggest monomial in F. And if we keep doing this, we eventually make F zero. Um, so this actually gives an algorithm for expressing every symmetric function as a polynomial in the F in the elementary symmetric functions. There's one slight thing that looks a bit suspicious about this. If you look at this proof, where did we use the fact that this is a symmetric polynomial? Um, it looks at first sight as if we've written every polynomial as a, as a monomial in symmetric functions. Well, the, the key point is that if F is symmetric, this implies that N1 is greater than or equal to N2 is greater than or equal to N3 and so on. Um, as you can easily check. And we need this because these numbers here must all be greater than or equal to zero. Otherwise, um, you, otherwise these things wouldn't be polynomials. So that shows that every symmetric polynomial and every, every invariant of um, the symmetric group acting on polynomials is, is generated by these. So the invariance of Sn acting on C to the N um, are finitely generated 
algebra over C. Um, so this means that you can find a finite number of invariants such that every invariant is a polynomial in those with coefficients in C. So this is um, maybe the first non-trivial example of, of invariants being finitely generated. I mean, in fact, it's quite easy to check that the algebra of invariants um, is a polynomial ring um, over the invariants E1 up to En. In other words, there are no non-trivial relations between them, which I won't bother checking because it's very easy. Um, and this is actually very unusual. Um, most of the time, if you've got a group acting on a space, the ring of invents might be rather complicated. You can find a set of generators, but there might be some relations between the generators, as we will see in the next example. Um, so I'd say this is unusual. Um, it tends to happen if G is a reflection group. That's a group generated by reflections in hyperplanes. And the symmetric group acting on, on CN happens to be a symmetric group, which is why its ring of invariance is particularly nice. So now we're going to see an example where the ring of invariance is a little bit more complicated. So this time, I'm going to take G to be AN which is the alternating group. And if you forgot what that is, I'll tell you in a moment. So the alternating group is a subgroup of Sn, the symmetric group. And well, we have the following polynomial, let's call it delta, which is going to be product of i less than j of xi minus xj. So it looks like x1 minus two if n equals two or x1 minus x2 x1 minus x3, x2 minus x3, if n is 3, and so on. And now you notice that every element of the symmetric group permutes these factors up to sign, so it, either, so it changes delta to either delta or minus delta. So a n is the subgroup of s n fixing delta. And you can see that a n has index 2, at least if n is greater than or equal to 2. And what I want to do now is ask, what are the invariant polynomials under the alternating group? Well, that's quite easy. This is just polynomials in E1 up to En. And then delta is also invariant because we pretty much defined a n to be the thing such that delta is an invariant. Um, so, um, and, um, so we saw, well, we stated that there are no relations between E1 up to E n. However, there are relations between E1 up to E n and delta because you notice delta squared is symmetric so is a polynomial in E1 up to En. And we can figure out what this is explicitly. For instance, let's take N equals two. Then we find delta squared is X1 minus X2 squared. And this is equal to X1 plus X2 squared minus four X1 X2, which is equal to E1 squared minus four E2. Um, now, um, when n gets larger, you can still express delta squared in terms of these, but the expression gets kind of complicated. For instance, here I've got a picture of it for degree four polynomials. I guess I'll just try and magnify this a bit. Okay, so here we have the discriminant of a fourth degree polynomial, and you can see it's already getting a bit of a mess. Um, it's two lines long and as the degree goes up, this discriminant gets worse and worse. Um, so this is an example of something called a syzygy. 
So let's sum up what happens for a n. The ring of invariance is finitely generated. Oops, sorry, I better turn the magnification back down. It's finitely generated by E1 up to E n delta, but there is a non-trivial relation where um, delta squared minus some polynomial in E1 up to E n is equal to zero. So here that the, the invariant ring is no longer a polynomial ring, it's something a little bit more complicated. Um, and it's fairly straightforward to check that this is essentially the only non-trivial relation and that any other relation between delta and all of these is got by taking this relation and multiplying it by some polynomial. So that's an example of a first order syzygy. However, things can get a little bit more complicated. So let's see an example of a second order syzygy. So for this, I'm going to take G to be the cyclic group of order three. And I'm going to let it act on two dimensional vector space. And I'm going to let it act in a very boring way. I'm just going to put, um, suppose sigma cubed is equal to one where sigma is in G as a generator. And I'm just going to put sigma xy is equal to omega x omega y where omega cubed is equal to one. So omega is e to the two pi i over three, which is minus a half plus root three i over two, if you're interested, which you probably aren't. And now let's try and find some invariant polynomials. Well, it's not too difficult to figure out what all the invariant polynomials are. We notice that x to the a, y to the b is invariant if a plus b is divisible by three, because omega just multiplies this by a cube root, which is one if a plus b is divisible by three. Um, and so the ring of invariance is generated as an algebra by the following monomials. We have x cubed, x squared y, x y squared, and y cubed. So let's call these z zero, z one, z2, z3. And it's easy to check that these generate the algebra of invariance. However, there are some relations or syzygies between these because we notice that z0, z3 equals z1, z2, z0, um, z2 equals z1 squared, and um, z1, z3 equals z2 squared. So here we have three syzygies. Well, um, things are a little bit more complicated than that because we've not only got three syzygies. So, um, so we can write the syzygies like this. We put z0, z3 minus c1, z2, and let's call that a2. And then we have z1 squared minus c0, z2, and let's call that a3. And we have z2 squared minus c1, z3. I'm going to call that a1. And now we notice that a2, a3, and a1 are related because a z1, a1 plus c2, a2 plus c3, a3 equals naught. So these are the first order syzygies. And this is a relation between syzygies. So this is a sort of second order syzygy. Um, so things are beginning to get a bit more complicated. Well, in order to see what's going on, let's draw a picture. So we've got a map from the ring of polynomials in Z0, Z1, Z2, 
Z3, onto the ring of invariants. Um, and this map has a non-trivial kernel, and let, let, let's call this ring R so that I don't have to keep writing it out. So the kernel is an ideal, and this ideal is generated by three elements, A1, A2, A3. So we can map A1 to whatever it was, Z2 squared minus Z1, Z3, and A2 and A3 go to um, those other expressions. But there's a, so this is a three-dimensional free module over R mapping onto the ideal of relations, with, and which is really a sub-module. So this is a map of modules from this module to this module. And the relation between A1, A2, and A3 can be thought of as a map from a free module in one generator to R cubed. So this is mapping the element B. Let's call this B. This maps B to Z1, A1, plus Z2, A2, plus Z3, A3. Um, and now what we have here is something called an exact sequence. So an exact sequence means that the kernel of each map, like the map from here to here, is exactly the image of the previous map. So that's just saying that B, whose image is here, um, gives you all the relations between A1, A2, and A3, and that any other relation between A1 and A2 and A3 is got by multiplying this by an element of the ring R. And similarly, um, A1, A2, and A3 form a basis of all the relations between Z0, Z1, Z2, and Z3. So, um, so this is pretty much what happens in general. So I suppose we've got a ring... Um, of invariance of some group acting on some vector space, what we do is we have an invariant ring. And we have a map from this from some set of polynomials, say K, Z, naught, Z1, and so on, onto it. And if I call this ring R, then we have some relations between the Ris, which are syzygies, and we might be able to find some syzygies forming a basis of this. So we have um, some map from a free module R to the M to this, and then there would be a map from some other free module to this, and some map from some other free module to this. It might go on and on and on and on like this. So these are the first order syzygies. or at least, and these are the second order and so on. And you, as you can imagine, you can get higher order, but I'm not gonna write anything out because it really gets to be a bit of a mess. Um, so um, we can now ask the following questions. First of all, is R finitely generated as a K algebra? In other words, can we find a finite number of elements zi? And then we can ask, is, is the module of first order syzygies, is r to the m finitely generated as an r module? And notice I'm contrasting um, the ring r, which is we want to be finitely generated as an algebra, but all these, we only want to be finite generated as modules. In other words, we're asking, is this number, can we take this number M to be finite? And to see the difference, we notice that say a polynomial ring in X is finitely generated as an algebra over K because it's just finitely generated by X, but it's not finitely generated as a module over K because you need an infinite number of powers of X to span this as a module. And then we can ask is, R to the n finitely generated as an R module. So if we've got a finite number of first order syzygies, we can ask, are the second order syzygies relating them also finitely generated and so on. Um, actually from this, you can uh, sort of see why a syzygy is called a syzygy because um, for instance, this second order syzygy B is kind of yoking together 
the first order syzygies A, B, A1, A2, and A3. I mean, you know, a, a yoke would, would tie several oxen together, and here the syzygy is tying several polynomials together in a way that isn't really at all like oxen being tied together, but whatever. Um, and then finally, we can ask, does this sequence of free R modules go on forever? You can see that in this particular example, um, it stopped after two things because this map here was injective. So we can ask, is this chain of modules finite? So we've got three different sorts of finiteness questions. We want to know if this is gener finitely generated as a Algebra, we want to know if these are finite generators modules, and we want to know if this long chain is, is finite in length. And Hilbert showed um, the answer is yes, if G is reductive and your field K has characteristic zero. Well, I guess he was working over complex numbers, but it's close enough. Um, so what does reductive mean? Well, I'm not going to worry about that too much because we're not going to do the general case of reductive groups. We're just going to do the special case when G is a finite group and K has characteristic zero. Um, so the next few lectures, we will be developing the commutative algebra necessary to prove, well, we'll be doing at least the first two of Hilbert's theorems. The third one may or may not come later on in the course, depending on um, what I feel like. Um, so the next lecture, we will have some more examples of invariant rings, which are rather closer to the problem that Hilbert was actually looking at.